think the last time we sang this song, Lord, I need you. So I want this song to be a prayer for this week for you. Because it's all about how, how, we need, how we need God in our lives. And I was reading one thing recently, how some people that don't go to church and the people that you encounter if not going to church, you are their church. And if you minister to them and everything, that's pretty much all they have. And, if they, and then you can obviously invite them to church. But sometimes, and I was reading, it's not the building to make the church, it's you. You are the church, you are. And so we kind of want to make that our prayer and how we need God to help us in that process. Well, good morning, folks that are with us and folks that are watching us. We're glad to have you with us today as we spend some time worshiping our Savior and spend some time looking at one of the names of God that comes up in Genesis 17. If you want to go ahead and find it, that's the first place I believe in Scripture we see it discussed and mentioned. Uh, that name is a very unique name, uh, but also one that means a lot to us. It's used then and again throughout Scripture uh, multiple times uh, to remind us of who God is. So in Genesis 17, a very familiar text. So if you're able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, those that are here? And uh, Genesis 17, we're going to read quite a few verses uh, through about verse 22. 
And, he, and uh, it says this in verse 1, give you a chance to find it for those that are turning. I hear a few pages turn. That's always good. I love hearing pages turn still in these days of, as I'm sitting here with my tablet, right? It says, now when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceeding, exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be, to, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings and all the land of Canaan and, and an, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant and you and your descendants after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant that you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house of who is brought, bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your descendants. A servant who is born in your house, who is brought, bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised, and thus shall be my covenant, be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people, and he has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and he said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear a son, and you will call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard to you, and I will behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly, and he shall become a father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my servant I will but my covenant I will establish with Isaac from Sarah. It will bear up to you and this season at this season next year. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for what we're looking at today, and I pray, Father, that as we spend some time looking at Abraham and his encounter with you, El Shaddai, that it will change everything about our perspective of who you are and remind us of the great almighty God that we serve and worship. Bless this time and use it. May you be exalted through it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is, uh, as I said, a name that has a special place for many of us because we use it a lot when we talk about God. We call him the Almighty, and that's where it comes from. It is in the Hebrew, El Shaddai, and uh, that's what it means. And it is first mentioned here. And the, the way it, I think it's kind of interesting. Of all the texts that could have been mentioned, it happens in this part of the Bible, in this story that many of us are familiar with, that we've heard a time or two and kind of wonder. It's just one of those things when you think about God and about the way he relates to his, his children and his people. I'm always mystified by this a little bit. Uh, I mean... I don't know if we have anybody in here that's 90. Uh, I can't imagine, my, I'm, not, I'm not 90. I know some of you think I'm really old, but I'm not that old yet. Uh, if I make it that far, there's no guarantee I'll get that far. But to be told at 90 plus, you're going to be a dad, and your wife who is already 90 is going to be a mother, just doesn't seem possible, does it? Nor is it something that I would think many people at that age would want to engage in that kind of a journey. But that is what God has told Abraham and Sarah, who at that time it's Abram and Sarai. And that's interesting. Those names do change who they are. Uh, the, the name that they change that they receive is an actual transformation in what's going to take place in their lives. And so I won't get into a lot of that. I'll let you do some word study on your own. There's your homework assignment for today to kind of do a study on the change and what those names actually mean and what God was trying to tell them about what was going to take place in their life. And I think what God is trying to tell us here when he uses this name is that he can do whatever he wants. 
And he possesses all power, all authority, all ability to accomplish whatever he wants in your life and my life. And just as he did with Abraham and Sarah, he is giving them something and going to tell them something's going to take place that doesn't make sense, but he is El Shaddai. He is the Almighty. It will be done because he said it will be done. And I can't help but think that if I were in Abraham's shoes, I would not be a little bit perplexed by this statement and what was going to happen. I might wonder, God, are you really sure this is how you want to do it? I mean, we already have a son through his, uh, his maidservant, and his name is Ishmael, and he's, he's a young man. You can, you can use him. That This will work. And God says, no, that's not my plan. My plan is to do something that only I can do. No one else can do what God does in this situation. And many of you may have encountered situations in your life where you have wondered, God, if you don't show up, it's not going to happen. If you don't come and intervene at this circumstance in my life, things are not going to work out in the way I hoped, or they're not going to work out at all. And I think maybe perhaps for the first time in a long time, the church in the United States of America is beginning to experience a little bit of that angst and emotion right now. We've been through some trying times in the church in our land for a while as we've all kind of you know, shifted into these different ways of doing worship. A lot of the things that we were comfortable doing, a lot of things that we were used to doing, we haven't been able to do for a while. And we're not sure when and if we'll ever get to back to going to do what we used to do. I don't think we will go back doing things the way we've always done them. And maybe that's probably a good thing because the way we were doing it wasn't working anyway. It wouldn't. Let's be honest. And maybe God is using this season to stretch us in ways we never imagined we'd be stretched before. And to remind us that our trust is in Him. That He alone is the Almighty. No one else can do what God can do. We see this again and again through Scripture, but in this instance specifically we're going to hone in on this morning. This is just an amazing demonstration of God's power and God's ability to accomplish whatever he desires. He has promised Abraham at 90 plus, I'm going to make you a father to many nations. How many children do Abraham and Sarah have at this point? Zero. The one they have is from Hagar, right? And he's already said he doesn't count. That's not what's what I want. I want, it's going to be you and Sarah. This is going to be the child of promise. He has no children. No one. And he is definitely... Sarah is definitely past childbearing years. Can we agree on that? And I would imagine that every woman in this room would agree with me and say that they, they would appreciate to remain beyond childbearing years if they make it to 90. Would that be a, a fair assessment? I mean, that does not sound like something that any woman at that age would want to go through, but that is what Sarah is going to do, and that's what's going to take place, and God has promised that will happen, and God is saying it's going to happen because I am El Shaddai. I am the Almighty. I will do as I desire in your life. I will accomplish this. And like Abraham and Sarah, there are things in our lives that we often face that make us question and make us wonder, God, are you going to work through this? Are you going to show up? And it comes in a variety of situations. It can be issues with your family. It can be issues with your health. It can be issues with the job. It can be challenges you see in our culture today. And I think I can honestly say, and I think many would agree with me, that if God does not show up in the church of Jesus Christ in this land, America is doomed. She is done. If it, and, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just being honest. I'm not laying it at the hands of the politicians. I'm not laying it at the hands of our president. I am laying it at the hands of God's people. This is the only way this country will survive is if we step up and become who God has called us to be and we get on our knees before God. I think God is calling his people to something better than we've ever imagined before. I think God really wants to do something in this land that he hasn't done for a very long time. And he's been waiting on his people to quit trusting in themselves, to quit planning and programming, to quit trying to say we can do it if we do this, that, or the other, and just say I'm going to trust God and let God lead. And Abraham and Sarah found themselves in that point, didn't they? Going to have a child in your 90s. So, key, that's never happened before. Have you noticed in Scripture, God often does things that have never happened before? Things that aren't normal, things that are just kind of strange, things that no one else would imagine is the way that often our Creator works in the lives of 
those whom are his children. And he works in our lives as that way as well, doesn't he? And many of you may have a testimony, maybe hopefully, probably not similar to Abraham and Sarah, but you have a testimony of some work that God has done in your life when pretty much everybody else said there's no hope. There's no way it can be accomplished. There's no way it can be done. And then God showed up and God did what only God can do. And brothers and sisters, I believe we desperately need that in the church of Jesus Christ in this land today. And part of that will only come when we really understand that great truth and that great reality that God is exactly who he says he is. So this is a name of God that I said is, is used many times in Scripture, and we use it ourselves. There are many songs written about this name, but it's a reminder of who God is. Because God will accomplish His purposes, sometimes even when it doesn't look possible. I don't know how aware you are. If you remember, we, when I first got here, we kind of went through a sermon series on Acts. Does anybody remember that? A couple? Okay, a handful. That's good. I'm not, I'm not expecting you to remember. I'm not going to do a test. Don't worry. You're good. I'm not going to ask you what we taught because... I probably don't remember either, so we're not going to go there. But if you remember, the early church had some struggles becoming the church that we know today because the early church was primarily made up of Jewish believers because that's where it was located in, in, in Israel, in Palestine, in the part of the world where there's primarily Jews. And so the early church was primarily composed only of Jewish believers, and there was a great struggle. They even had a big council over this as to whether or not they should take the gospel to those who weren't Jewish. That would be Gentiles. And I'm going to gather that most of us in this room are Gentiles, and that means non-Jewish. That's all it means, because I know I am. And if you are not Jewish, then you are Gentile. That's pretty much the way it works. And they had decided that only Jews needed the gospel. Many of the people believed that, and they weren't going to reach outside because they didn't really like Gentiles, to be honest with you. That was part of it. And they didn't want to take the gospel outside of their culture. They didn't feel, they let, feel led to do that or they weren't going to listen. And they, didn't, they missed that part. You remember when Jesus gave the Great Commission and you will make disciples of all nations, they kind of missed that, I guess, some of them. But God specifically called out one man for that purpose. And of all the people he called out, I would not have chose this guy. He was a zealous Jew, so zealous to the point that he was actually did not believe in Jesus at the time. He was persecuting the church. You know him as the Apostle Paul. He was originally Saul of Tarsus. And his goal before he became a Christian was to annihilate this thing they called the way, these, these followers of this false Messiah, he wanted to kill them, round them up, send them in jail. We've got to stop this, this junk before it spreads and becomes a problem. We must stop it. That was his mission in life. And he was a zealous Jew. He was one who understood the law, knew many teachings of the law. He could teach it and, and communicate it. And he was trying to live it out and flesh out his faith, his belief, as best he could. And he believed part of that was to imprison followers of Jesus Christ. And then we know, we, we looked at that in, in Acts 19 where he had an encounter with Jesus on the way to Damascus to go round up believers. And it changed his life. But not only did it change Saul to Paul, it changed us. And it made the gospel available to those who were not of Jewish heritage and an understanding of the Jewish scriptures of the word of God, the Old Testament. We, we had no clue as, as, in general as a culture, as, as non-Jews. We didn't know. But Paul's calling specifically by God was to take the gospel to those who had never heard, to the Gentiles. And God used that to change the lives of people that you and I have never met. Did you know that? Thousands of years ago, almost 2,000 almost, almost years ago, not quite 2,000 years ago, 1,900 and some years ago, you can do the math. Paul died around 50-something A.D. But in that time where he was serving as a missionary, many people came to know Christ who were not of Jewish heritage. And that gospel impacted and spread from there throughout the world. And many of us, all of us are in this room, pretty much almost all of us are in this room because of the Apostle Paul's faithfulness to that message. And him knowing and believing that God Almighty, El Shaddai, had called him to accomplish this. And even though he, didn't, he wasn't sure how it was going to work, he trusted God would do it. And God did it and continues to do it. And now God continues to call us as his children 
to continue to share that message in places where it has not been heard. You know, I've, there's been a lot of videos lately about Jesus coming back and Bible prophecy on the internet. Have you noticed that? They're all over the place, because everybody, and everybody's got a, an idea and a thought. And you know what? None of us know what's going to happen. I'm just going to, if somebody tells you they know what's going to happen, you can pretty much count them off the list. Then don't listen to them, because nobody knows. But there is a clue in Scripture as to when the end will come. And Jesus gives that clue, and you can look it up later in Matthew 24. And he says, when the gospel is shared in all nations, when everybody's had a chance to, to hear, basically, when it's the every, everybody's got a chance, it's, we've got, it's everybody when everyone's heard, and then the end shall come. That's the final piece in the puzzle of prophecy, if you will. Imagine that image for the return of the Lord. And brothers and sisters, we are so close in the kingdom. We're not done yet, but we're very close. And I pray it happens soon. I don't know when it's going to happen. Once again, not a prophet, not the son of a prophet. Don't profess to know, don't claim to know, but I know that God is at work. And wouldn't it be amazing if God decided to do something through all this mess to raise up his church to what we need to truly be, to truly be the church of Jesus Christ that we're supposed to be in this land, surrendered fully to him and allow him to use us and out of this awakening that might take place, out of the Holy Spirit's work again, a new refresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church of Jesus Christ, that the missionaries would come, the last missionaries that were ever needed to take the gospel to the last place on earth or where the people have not been reached, to usher in the coming of the king. Wouldn't that be amazing? Shouldn't that be our prayer as followers of Christ? Don't we want other people to know? I hope so. Because somebody wanted us to know. Every one of us in this room, every one of you listening to me online in this moment, have that opportunity to hear the gospel because somebody else was willing to share the gospel with someone else and to step outside what was normal, what was comfortable, and give you and I that opportunity. And I will never be able to fully express my gratitude for those that were willing even though it was hard, even though they were afraid of being maybe a little bit made fun of or persecuted, and in Paul's day, many of these believers suffered horrendous things, and yet they were faithful and strong and willing to share the gospel no matter what. I am grateful for those believers because because of their faithfulness, I had the opportunity to know Jesus, and now I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And God always accomplishes what God wants to accomplish. Because he is the Almighty. And when Abraham was told that by God in that encounter, because you notice how God introduced himself in Genesis 17? Did you catch, catch that? That's where the name is used. El Shaddai, El, God Almighty, is speaking to you. And he tells him what he's going to do, and Abraham then responds with laughter. That's not going to happen. It can't happen. I guess Abraham didn't understand what Almighty means. And I would dare say that many of us in the church of Jesus Christ today do not either. We think we do, we say we do, we sing the songs, but when the troubles come, when the challenges come, when things that we don't fully comprehend and understand come away, we're like, God, I don't think so. I don't think you can do this, God. Oh, really? Someone like me who's been around for 50 plus years and has done pretty much nothing compared to God, if you want to just, let's just be honest, is going to tell the creator of the universe, the Almighty, the one who everything that we see came with a word that he spoke. He didn't, you know, craft it. He just spoke it and it came into being. The one who possesses all, I'm going to tell him how to do his job. Right? That make a lot of sense. And yet, we do. We try to, I love how people try to critique God. Really? When was the last, what was the last thing that you and I ever made out of nothing? That's right, nothing. And yet, Abraham in these moments is like, God, that doesn't happen, God. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way it goes, God. You don't understand. My wife is not a young woman, and I am not a young man, God. It's not going to happen. Okay, Abraham. This time next year, there'll be a little one in your house. Yeah. You marked my word, boy. I, he didn't say it that way, but, you know, I think it would have been really cool if he'd said it that way. What do you think? 
He said, let me just tell you the way it is, Abraham. Now, I'm going to extrapolate. This is not in the Bible, okay? So don't say that I'm quoting the Bible here. I'm not. But this is if I were, you know, I, I like the idea that God would just kind of, sometimes like the way of God just kind of put us in our place. You know, and he does that. And the only place he really does that in real full authority in Scripture is in Job, at the end of Job, which is, you know, the book of Job is hard to read because there's a lot of stuff going on there and there's a lot of talking and there's some really stupid people in the book of Job. But anyway, they have a, think they have a lot of good ideas. When God finally lays it out and says, this is the way, my fa- one of my favorite phrases in all of Scripture, where were you, Job, when I created the foundations of the earth? Huh? Where were you? And then he goes off and lists all these things. That, where were you at when I did all this? And he starts naming off all these things that he's done. And I can imagine him wanting to say that to Abraham in those moments. Abraham, you have no idea really who you're talking to. There is nothing that is beyond his scope and power that we can come up with. It may look at this time in our world like we are completely out of control and this is an unholy mess, right? It may look like Satan has won and he is having a heyday. And we are seeing division all around us. We are seeing division in the church. We are seeing all kinds of things take place that make it appear as if it's over and God lost. You know, it looked that way about 2,000 years ago, too. God sent his one and only son to this planet to be our Savior. And he did amazing miracles. He did incredible things. And what did we do? We crucified him. And on that Friday night after he died, I bet they had a party in hell. What do you think? I bet the demons and Satan, they were just, we won. Yeah, we did it. We've, we've accomplished all we've accomplished. And they, had a, they probably had a, they had a three-day party, I bet. But it, I bet it went, kept going on, you know, because they were just excited about what they had done. And it looked like it was over. In fact, Jesus even said it was over. Well, he didn't say it was over. He said it's finished. Important differentiation. Remember that. Now, we all know how the story ends. We know what happened after that. We know what happened Sunday morning. But a lot of people forgot what happened Friday. Because when he said it's finished... He wasn't just talking about his death. He was talking about all the penalty of all the sins that ever committed in that moment are done. They're all paid. It's over. And if you don't believe that, there was something that happened that Friday that demonstrated that was true. A physical event that happened in the temple that should forever be burned in our minds, a reminder of what God Almighty can do that God can create a relationship with us, that God can deliver us, that God can do whatever he pleases when he tore the temple veil from top to bottom to remind us that the separation between us was over. There's a new way to relate to God now. You have a new high priest. His name is Jesus. I don't have to go offer the blood of bulls and rams and all that kind of stuff, you know, to have time with God, to fellowship and pray with him. The blood of the sinless Son of God has made it available to you and to me that any time I desire, I can fall on my knees, go to the Almighty, and be in the literal presence of God in the Holy of Holies with my Creator because of what Jesus Christ has done, and so can you. Because of what the Almighty was able to accomplish. So what he accomplished for Abraham and Sarah here is really kind of, dare I say, easy for him. This is nothing big. Say, well, 90 year old people having kids? It's big, yeah, but saving the whole world, I think, is a little bigger. What do you think of that? Would you agree with me? These are things that only He can do. And our great God, our Almighty, who's accomplished this again and again, is the same God that we see in Scripture that is the same God is relating to us today. And the same God that whatever you are dealing with in in your life, whatever you think is beyond His power and control, it is not. God, you don't know where I've been. Oh, really? God knows exactly where you are. He knows what's going on in you, things that nobody else knows. Your parents don't know. Your best friend don't know. Your spouse may not know. Nobody knows what's going on inside you like he knows because he knows you better than anybody. 
And he knows when we're afraid and he knows when we struggle and he knows when we wonder, God, I don't think I can make it. I don't think it's going to work. God, I'm ready to quit. Don't quit, child. Trust me. Trust me. Like, God, I, I don't know if I can. You know, you don't see the things I see. I love it when I, we try to make up these excuses and how stupid they sound when we really think about them. To tell God that he doesn't understand my situation when he knows all things. We talked about that, all knowing. To say that he doesn't, he can't help my situation when he says very right here, very clearly, I am El Shaddai, I am all powerful, I can do whatever I desire. I can work through any situation. Which that text shares. For those of you that made it, to, I really hope you start trying. If you can't make it here physically, try and join us for our Bible study time. That was a, a powerful Bible study lesson this morning and a reminder that God is able to work even when it doesn't look like he can work. And often it's through the most difficult and painful times of our life where God does the most amazing work in our lives, doesn't he? And I bet if we started going in this room, I bet several of you have testimonies like that. You can think back to a situation in your life when it looked hopeless, when it looked like God was not going to show up. It looked like you weren't going to make it, and then God showed up, and God did what only God can do, and you are here as a testimony of that. And God doesn't always work out the way we'd like him to. doesn't always do things the way we think he should, but God always does things in a way that he knows are best. And he always accomplishes his purposes in and through our lives in a way that brings him glory. Because he is the Almighty. There is no one that can do what God can do. And there is no one in all the universe that has a passion and a love for you like he has for you, my friend. I can't even, I can't quantify it. I can't even fully explain it. It just, it's, it's beyond even what I can express in words. The way that he loves you and cares for you and the, and the way that he knows everything about you and your situation. He desires to move and work in your life. And he looks at you and he calls you child. Did you know that if you're a follower of his? You're one of his kids. Anybody out there proud of their kids? Well, sure. I'm not going to ask grandparents to raise their hands because that's just redundant. That ain't going, I know the answer to that question. We're proud of them because they're ours. Do they do everything that we want, that we want them to do? <laughs> Not even close, do they? But we still love them. Even sometimes when they don't love us, we love them in spite of them. We love them because of who they are and the work that God has done in us. And we continue to do that. And it's hard sometimes in those relationships, isn't it? It can be a stress. There are good times and the struggle times, but can you imagine how much more, if I'm able to love like that, if you're able to love like that, how much more is the Almighty able to love like that? What is the limitations on God's love? What is the scope of His love? If my love is like this, how much wider, how much farther does the scope of His love go? How much more capable of love is God than you or I? That distance, brothers and sisters, is immeasurable. It is enormous. And that's the God who calls you child. That's the God who wants to work in and through your life. Is it going to go as exactly as you hope? No. Do I, do I have a five-step formula for you? Sure don't. And neither does this book. But I do know this, if you trust him and let him work, he will accomplish in and through you things you never dreamed and use your life in ways you never imagined and do things through you that only he can accomplish because he is the Almighty. There's nobody like him. There's no one that compares to him. There's no one that can even claim that name. See, everything we've looked about God these last several weeks, when we've looked at some of the names of God, are reminders of who God says he is and what he's able to do in our lives, in your life as well. Because he doesn't want you to give up. He doesn't want you to be afraid. And if you're afraid and you want to give up, he just says this. Turn to me, child. Take a look my direction. Trust me. I've got this. Do you think there is anything 
in this life that you or I could ever face. That God hasn't already seen a thousand times over. Do you? A lot of times we think, well, this only happened to me. Oh, really? One of the things I love about history is I can see when I look back at history that people were just as stupid back then as they are today. Amen? Did some dumb stuff. I mean, let's just be honest. Our ancestors did some really stupid stuff, just like we do stupid stuff. That's one of the, that's one of the I, don't, I guess that's part of sin, right? That's the way it works. It's just that transfer. Maybe it's not just sin. Maybe it's stupidity is transferable through generations. I don't know. Because it seems to me we make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And yet, God is merciful. Just as much as God loved Abraham and Sarah for laughing. I mean, Sarah laughed at God too. For what God said he was going to do. And we sometimes mock God as, well, God, there's no way you could do that. But our God is bigger than our laughter. He's bigger than our critiques. And sometimes I think, in a way, it's kind of like a challenge. Oh, you don't think I can do that? Oh, really? Watch me. Pray with me. Father, I thank you. I thank you for being El Shaddai, the God Almighty, the, the one who can do only what you can do. And I pray, Lord, that if there is one today, whether here or within the sound of my voice that does not know you, that today would be the day that that individual, man, woman, boy, or girl, would come to know you as Lord and Savior. And Father, if they need help with that in the process, there are many here, and many of us, as well as our brothers and sisters that are online, that would be more than happy to help them with that process. It's it's not that hard coming to do that. You've made it very easy easy for us. You've done all the heavy lifting so that we can come to know you. Lord, I pray that you would do the work that you need to do in our hearts and lives today as you draw us to yourself. Bless this time and use it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chelsea. We're going to end with blessed assurance.